Hello, everyone. Um, great to see so many faces uh, popping up on our uh, screens. Um, my name's Lisa Button. I'm the Executive Director of the Community Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, for those of you who I haven't met before. Um, I'm expecting that people are going to continue to, uh, to join as we get started, but we have a lot to cover in, a, in an hour, so uh, I don't want to waste any time in getting into it. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge on behalf of myself and all of our presenters today, the traditional owners of the land um, from which we are all zooming in from. In my case, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here in Melbourne and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and any Indigenous people who might be with us today. Um, a few little bits of housekeeping. I would like to flag that we are recording this session so that we can make it available to uh, uh, other individuals who weren't able to attend today and it'll probably also go up on our website. If you're not familiar with Zoom, you can find controls, particularly the chat box, um, by hovering either at the top or the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll use that chat box for any questions that, that you have along the way, um, uh, as well as conveying a few bits of information from time to time. We're gonna ask you all to keep yourselves on mute, um, given the number of people we're expecting in excess of 100 people, possibly uh, closer to 200 coming in today. So it's, it's going to be more of a seminar style um, a session. We will be receiving questions through that chat box. Um, it's unlikely that we're going to have time for um, a chat, but this is only just the beginning of this um, conversation. So don't worry, we'll get plenty of opportunities. Um, if you have any bandwidth issues with your internet connection, you might want to consider turning your camera off. And I might have to do the same from time to time. Um, so we'll just have to troubleshoot along the way. And I will ask um, just all of our speakers to, to be brief um, in their remarks because we do have a lot of ground to cover. And if you find me um, waving a, a purple post-it note, it's a, a sign to try and wrap up your comments. Um, now, some of most of you who are here would have um, RSVP'd to this and, and given us your details in the process of doing that. If by chance you've not done that already, perhaps a, a family member or a friend forwarded you the invitation, um, could you please take a moment to um, complete that RSVP form just so we can capture your details for the purposes of any future communications. Um, and I believe that Asha is, um, uh, Asha is going to put up a link to that um, RSVP uh, page in, in the chat box. It's also available on our website. Um, I'd like to get things going by introducing Libby Lloyd, the chair of our initiative. Um, Libby is, uh, has a strong background working with refugees and was made a member of the Order of Australia in 1992 for her contribution to refugees and the international community in Iraq and Kuwait. She co-founded the White Ribbon Foundation in 2007 and is currently patron of the Indigo Foundation, along with many other hats that she wears. Uh, Libby, would you like to make a few opening remarks? Uh, thank you. Um, for the past four decades, I've worked with refugees offshore with UNHCR in various arms of government and in the community. I know that there's four critical points in each refugee's journey. One, when they leave their country, two, when they claim asylum, three, when they're accepted. But the most important is four, and the, which is their long-term long settlement. That's really most crit critical. I've seen many models in many of settlement in many countries, but by far the best settlement I've ever seen is those that use multiple approaches and encourage multiple and maximum connections in the new community. We did have the Community Refugee Settlement Scheme in Australia for about 20 years from 1979 and many of us were involved with the CRWS and to this, to this day retain friendships and connections with those refugees from as long as, as long as 40 years ago and even with their children and with their grandchildren. Canada's had a sim similar uh, program from 1979 till the present though it evolved differently. Canada sustained their model 
through many governments over 40 years, and it's now well embedded in Canadian society. It's truly ex um, uh, exciting to see that um, CRSI, CRSI is now looking to implement something similar in Australia and starting to put this mentoring program in place. Now we can truly engage our connections through utilizing practical skills, providing and undertaking training and growing important links ready for the real opening of our CR, CRSI, Community Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, post-COVID, whenever that might be. I look forward to developing this new program alongside and with you and from here on. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Libby. Um, and it's so great to have your, your experience and wisdom uh, along with uh, that of, of all the people who are participating today. Um, just to give you a quick rundown of how we're going to run the session, um, we're going to have a short, show a short video about refugee sponsorship and how it's working um, in, at a global scale. Uh, we'll have a few words from two um, very inspiring individuals who have lived experience themselves as, as refugees. Um, I'm going to provide some background on our, our initiative and why we are launching the group mentorship program at this time. Um, my colleague Stephanie Jones, um, who's recently joined us, um, is going to then provide some more detailed information on that group mentorship program. And then we're going to um, finish off with uh, a Q&A, answering some of the questions that some of you have already uh, lodged with us as well as um, covering any additional questions that are appearing in the chat box. And I'm fearful that we won't get to cover everything, but um, don't worry if your question isn't answered. As I mentioned earlier, there will be a lot of opportunity uh, in the future as, as we get to know one another better. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Asha to hit play on the video and hopefully you'll all be able to see and hear that. Community sponsorship is a groundbreaking approach to helping refugees find safety. This approach brings small groups of local citizens together to welcome newcomers into their communities. This is another part of just being part of a global community, being aware of other people and ourselves. And the reciprocal relationship is really exciting. Tens of thousands of people in a growing number of countries have taken part in community sponsorship programs to date. Others are working to launch similar programs. We are seeing amazing results, a positive impact in big cities and small towns. A family will now be identified for us. It's... This is giving grassroots ordinary people the responsibility for the entire journey that a family goes on from when they land at an airport through to them being completely resettled, integrated, happy. People live in the area where the refugees are going to live as well, so they are part of that community. We've discovered there are people in the community who have all sorts of skills to contribute. Estamos todos para tratar de integrar a gente que no eligió salir de su país, tuvo que salir de su país. No es solo al refugiado, es a la sociedad que la hace crecer, la hace estar más unida. One of the most important things in settlement is jobs. We actually need immigration from a workforce point of view. So my advice to business is to get involved either through providing mentor groups to help do the settlement or through hiring. Having things brought down to a community level really personalizes the whole issue. It combines the numbers with the integration capacity, so it not only increases the possibility of more resettlement places, but also looks to the quality of those resettlement places. Hoy le toca a este grupo desplazarse. Tal vez el día de mañana me tocará a mí, y ojalá llegue el día en que nadie tenga que salir forzadamente de su país. Entonces creo que hemos ganado en sensibilidad y en humanidad. The experience that we've had in Canada is that community-sponsored refugees tend to do really well, integrate very quickly into their host community. But the other thing is that the host communities are transformed by these refugees. I know for my children, it's been a real humbling experience for them as well. They will have grown up knowing that their family have been involved with bringing a family over from a country where life was very dangerous. 
they're very willing to be part of the community, yeah. to get involved in things, and it has been great to have them as part of the community. I mean, basically, they're going to be our friends for the rest of our lives. It is personal to help people be at home here in a place that I absolutely love. So that's my absolute dream, really. Great, well, I hope you all enjoyed that and it put you in the mood for this conversation. Um, that, that video was prepared by our colleagues at the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative who are helping us and others around the world um, establish community sponsorship um, programs. And the vision that you saw in that film is, is what we're really aiming for here. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, to you all Nidal Nuon, who is a, a new member of the steering committee of our initiative. Um, Nidal was born in an Ethiopian refugee camp uh, to South Sudanese parents and came to Australia as a refugee when she was 19. She's now a lawyer at uh, the Melbourne law firm Arnold Block Liebler um, and is recently uh, very often seen in, uh, in the media um, and in other forums as a, a well-known commentator on refugee and uh, multicultural issues. Nidal, would you like to say a few words? Um, thank you, Lisa, and, and also thank you to everyone who is here and ex expressed an interest in, um, in this initiative. Mine is to speak briefly about why I support this and why I think uh, many refugees in the diaspora will support an initiative like this, um, and why particularly the idea of community groups involvement um, is essential in this, in, in this area. Um, personally, as been mentioned, I was born and raised in a refugee camps and came to this country as a refugee and, and my whole life has been built on the opportunities that I've had in Australia here. So obviously I would support any initiative that increases the abilities of refugees to be resettled. And that's one of the things that this program does is to hopefully it can add on to providing more um, opportunities to increase the resettlement numbers of refugees in Australia. Um, the other issue is that when refugee camps, when refugee um, migrate here, sometimes they do not have the, the social connection and other connections to be able to build sustainable life. And having members of the community be involved in this um, provide ready access to those people's own network, um, as well as I suppose providing the individuals that provide the support to refugee with access to understanding other people's way of life and being. And that in itself um, foster greater outcomes for integration generally and our multicultural society um, more broadly. Um, so it's great to see so much interest um, because it suggests that this is something that has grassroots support um, and having that grassroots support would uh, definitely be instrumental in the success of this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nidal. Um, really great to hear your, your support for this um, initiative and, and to have your support um, as part of our steering committee. I'd now like to introduce Arash Bodba, who is a former refugee from Iran, now living in Australia. He travelled to Malaysia at the age of 17 um, and registered with UNHCR there and, and ended up um, finding his way to Australia after a, a five year wait uh, in Malaysia. He is now studying, studying for a Bachelor of Engineering and um, is a well-known leader in refugee advocacy in Australia um, through his leadership of a wide range of groups. And he's a regular attendee and um, speaker at um, global refugee conferences around the world as well as in Australia. Arash, would you like to share some reflections with us? Sure, thank you so much, Alisa, um, for your kind introduction. And it's really great to see many people here. Um, possibly, you know, it's, it's always hard to speak after NIDL, so I'll try um, to do justice. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, why I think this is such an important um, initiative going through that, you know, asylum seeker process and then refugee and then finally getting resettled. Um, really looking at the resettlement from the global perspective and the statistic, we know that many people um, are in the needs of protection, um, are really nowhere near getting into the safety. I have just actually became an Australian citizen two days ago, and I know that really mateship is real um, here after receiving so much kindness and support. 
uh, being only resettled uh, about five years ago as a refugee, uh, which really this has changed my life and my family's life entirely. But I know that many people are still left behind and I feel quite responsible uh, to help and support them in any way that I can. Uh, and community sponsorship is one of the best way I know. Uh, many of you have heard about the success of the community sponsorship in Canada, in Ireland, in UK and elsewhere. And I know that the energy, kindness and compassion really exists so strongly among us uh, Australian. I know, and I know that really um, a lot of people have been pushing together to have a just, fair and inclusive community sponsorship program here. And I know it's time. I'm glad to be one of the Creasy uh, ambassadors to be able to help with this. Uh, Creasy uh, has been a champion among other organizations to push for this. I'm so glad to know that this pilot is happening to have a group of mentors around the country to not only support the program, but really uh, together help refine and test this to see what exactly this could look like in Australia and what a day-to-day -day Australian can contribute and take ownership of helping people like me and my family to be new Australians. And this is not only really financial, but uh, emotional support and the settlement support for a family or an individual to come here and feel like home. And I think one of the major difference um, to the current program is um, that it's giving the space to the community to really take the lead. Um, and since you know the current program really fails to encourage the widespread community participation in supporting of the refugees. Having said that, I know whoever is signing up for this is not gonna be alone. Uh, many settlement organization, uh, faith group and refugees themselves are really ready to support you in, um, in this. I know it's a tough period for everyone, but with seeing all the supporters here on the call, uh, I know we are ready to share responsibility. And at the end of the day, shared responsibility is shared humanity. So thank you. Thank you so much, Arash, and it's great to have you as an ambassador for our initiative. Um, you're, you're a very powerful leader in this area. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the background and the context for the work that we're um, coordinating at the moment. Um, obviously, in the midst of this terrible uh, global health crisis, uh, we have an ongoing um, global challenge around uh, refugee and, and forced migration. Um, at the moment, the, the levels of forced migration around the world are at unprecedented levels with around 80 million um, forced migrants. Um, the resettlement opportunities for refugees um, who are a sub, subsection of um, that, that wider group of forced migrants are uh, very, very limited and um, grossly inadequate with less than 1% of refugees who need resettlement each year actually uh, getting those opportunities. And now you add to that the complexity, obviously, of the, the COVID situation, which has seen resettlement in Australia reduced to the smallest of trickles for the time being. Um, but we will see the other side of that. And at some point or another, um, Australia will resume uh, resettling refugees at, at scale. And we'd like to see uh, a community refugee sponsorship uh, pathway um, up and running alongside the government funded program um, and contributing to uh, the, the scale of resettlement in this country, as well as the quality of resettlement. Just a little bit about me, for those who don't know me, I've been working in this field um, as, a, as a lawyer uh, and as a policy um, advisor uh, for around 12 years um, with organisations like uh, the Centre for Policy Development, Save the Children Australia, uh, Refugee Legal and the Human Rights Law Centre. Um, my, my first initiation into refugee uh, legal work was um, representing clients uh, on Christmas Island making their protection claims. Um, a couple of years ago I had the, the fortune of becoming involved in this initiative um, along with uh, a number of people who are on this, this Zoom. Um, together we decided to form this, uh, this uh, initiative, the Community Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, as an independent uh, vehicle to speak both to government and to the community about this idea of um, a, a community sponsorship program in Australia and to build a vision for what that might look like in Australia and secure the necessary policy settings to enable uh, that to happen and, and to see it successfully launched in Australia. 
Uh, we have a lot of support from our members um, and also affiliates, many of whom are here today, including uh, representatives of Rural Australians for Refugees, uh, people who are involved in churches that are part of the Australian Churches Refugee Task Force, uh, the Australian Sanctuary Foundation um, movement. Um, I'd also like to uh, call out to uh, Carillo Gantner, the former chair of the Sydney Meyer Fund. Uh, the Sydney Meyer Fund has given us um, very generous funding uh, to, to fuel this work over a, th a three year period and very grateful uh, for that and, and for the fact that um, he's here today in his private capacity to find out more about this. Um, we work closely with UNHCR um, and, and a number of the leading settlement agencies in Australia as well as with um, Amnesty International and their My New Neighbour campaign, which is also uh, known to many of you. Um, we, we've made progress over those two years. While we don't yet have the program that we're looking for ultimately, uh, there has been um, a, a considerable building of momentum in the public conversation about community sponsorship. And uh, we feel that um, both at the policy level and at the community level, this is gaining increasing traction. I'm just going to share a couple of slides with you. Um, hang on. I've selected the wrong screen, I beg your pardon. Rookie error. Uh, hopefully you can all now see a, a map of Australia. Um, many of you represent a green or a blue dot on that map. These are individuals across the country who have expressed an interest in becoming uh, refugee sponsors. Um, and they really, it really is a map that reflects the population of Australia more generally. We have a lot of institutional support as well through a pledge that we launched with Settlement Services International late last year. We have around 100 uh, large and small organisations across the country who have pledged to get behind um, a, a fair and affordable community sponsorship program once uh, that becomes available. And uh, in terms of when that might happen, um, we're really excited to see that the government is currently reviewing the community uh, support program, which is Australia's current private sponsorship program, which is many of you know, is very, uh, very expensive and has a number of other features that make it uh, un unappealing to say, uh, to, to, to put it uh, mildly to many um, community groups who might otherwise be interested in supporting refugees. Um, recently, uh, Alison Larkins, who is the new Commonwealth Coordinator General uh, for uh, Migrant Services within the Department of Home Affairs, uh, made some very promising comments at a public forum about how closely the government is looking at the Canadian model in undertaking its review of its current policies. Um, it is clear that there are a lot of benefits of the Canadian approach um, and those benefits are known to government and, and they, they resonate with government objectives here around uh, ensuring that refugees who come here um, can, can settle well, can find work, uh, can uh, be facilitated in, in settling uh, in locations outside of the major cities um, and can enjoy you know, happy, uh, healthy, successful lives as new Australians. So we're encouraged by that and we feel like we're on the right. Um, I'm now just going to um, hand over to my colleague, Asher Hirsch, who is um, our senior policy advisor. He spends 50% of his time working um, with the Refugee Council of Australia and the balance of his time working with me on this initiative uh, and has considerable expertise um, in a number of areas of refugee policy, including this, and has been um, with me on this journey of developing a, a vision for a future sponsorship program in Australia. Asha, would you like to say a few words about what that vision looks like? Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, could you put up the, the other slide um, as well? So we, we've been advocating for a new and improved uh, community sponsorship program in Australia, uh, either a, a wholesale new program um, or something that is a, uh, a reform of the current uh, community support program, uh, the CSP. Uh, 
And you know, when we started this, I think we were um, dreaming quite big in terms of what we wanted to see and perhaps a little bit idealistic, but uh, our work over the last two years and even longer than that, um, we've actually seen a, a lot of the recommendations that we've been putting forward to be taken up with interest by the government and considered. And so we're, we're quite hopeful, as um, Lisa said, that we will see something uh, at least improved and, and expanded in some ways. And, and hopefully uh, as far as possible, along with our ultimate goal and ultimate idea of what a proper sponsorship, sponsorship program should look like in Australia. So we, we've set a few um, criteria and um, policy settings and benchmarks for what we think uh, a new program would in, uh, have, but uh, obviously we don't know exactly what will become of the government's review and uh, whatever might be adopted by the government. But should we get our, our wish list, um, we want to see a new program that really brings together community members uh, like yourselves, people who are maybe unrelated to refugees or people who are just part of the wider community and, and want to help. Uh, and those groups, uh, those individuals form a sponsor group of at least five people. And then they need to come under an auspice of another um, charity or uh, non-profit organization which can handle the money and um, make assurances to government for that. But really the, the bulk of the work is done by local groups rather than um, uh, agencies, organizations. It's really a grassroots community led initiative. So we, within that group, uh, the sponsors are expected to raise money for the first 12 months uh, of the person settlement journey. And that includes uh, uh, pre-arrival costs such as airfares and health checks, uh, on arrival costs such as um, setting up someone's house with furniture, um, some basic food and other essentials when people arrive, and then ongoing costs for the first 12 months, including any costs that people use uh, for social security through Centrelink. Uh, but more importantly as well, they, the, the sponsor group is really responsible for every aspect of the settlement journey uh, of new refugees. Uh, so they would help in uh, supporting people to uh, find their, uh, their way in the new community to orientate themselves, to enroll in school, to enroll in, in English classes, uh, help them find a job, help them um, find other community members um, to participate in, and really be a kind of holistic approach to settlement um, that is really powerful because you can use volunteers and, and sponsors uh, throughout the week and, and in all different parts of someone's life. Uh, we also see a role for government and UNHCR, and uh, we have a lot of this detailed later on, but I can just explain a little bit how this would work. Um, essentially, the government can play a role in, in vetting and matching uh, refugees who come through UNHCR's resettlement program to sponsor groups, uh, ensure that sponsor groups um, develop and adhere to a, a um, tailored settlement plan that is quite detailed in how the sponsors are going to support people. And the government would also be involved in uh, assessing sponsorship applications and ensuring that uh, people are indeed refugees in need of resettlement. Uh, so you can see a lot more detail on our website uh, where we have an explainer document. So if you go to uh, ausrefugeesponsorship.com.au and look at some of our publications, you can see our policy documents there. And this really explains the whole journey. Um, we have a, a colorful chart that might look a little bit daunting, but really highlights what each of the um, stakeholders roles will be in a new sponsorship program. And you can find um, your role as a sponsor group and what you might be doing in terms of um, supporting refugees, um, putting them forward in, in an application or being matched with a UNHCR sort of refugee. Uh, and then being responsible for that first 12 months of settlement until the end. Uh, so yeah, I think it's very exciting and, and something we hope um, to see. And, and this mental program, as we'll explain um, today, is kind of the, the first run and the first test of trying out a lot of these policy settings. Thank you. Thanks very much, Asha. Um, so everything that, that Ash has just explained is really the grand vision and, and now I guess what we could call the post-COVID vision um, and hopefully we'll be able to see that implemented sooner rather than later. 
Um, but we, we had had plans to, to pilot this program um, this year. And um, with, with the pandemic, um, we've had to think, well, what, how could, what parts of this um, vision could we activate now uh, to get ready for that grand vision? And that's where the group, the group mentorship program was born. So we use the term mentorship um, just to create a, a, a separate term to distinguish this initial preliminary program from that grander long-term vision of, of sponsorship. And, and really what this program is about is about demonstrating the viability and benefits of this um, community-led approach to supporting uh, refugees uh, in their settlement journey. It's about preparing local groups um, to become sponsors, to form groups to become sponsors in the future. It's about testing and refining some of our tools, in particular a, a training program that um, our global colleagues have helped us to develop. Um, and it's about further refining a sort of a shared vision um, in Australian society about what a future program will look like and, and how it will work, work best. Because obviously, um, while we're inspired by what's happening in Canada, we need a, uh, a program that is homegrown uh, by Australians, um, for Australians and for refugees. Um, so it, it's, it's an iterative process and, you know, the, the Canadian program wasn't created overnight, um, but we hope to fast track that 40 years by drawing on all the things that they've learned and all of the things that have been learned in the UK and Ireland and uh, New Zealand and many other countries that now have these sorts of programs. Um, the stakeholders involved in this group mentorship program are um, numerous and uh, while we wish to keep it very simple, we're conscious that it, it does take um, a lot of uh, different organisations being on board to see these sorts of things uh, off the, successfully launched. Um, so in addition to um, the staff of uh, Creasy and our, our member organisations, we have UNHCR um, involved, uh, the major settlement agencies, and I'll introduce some of the representatives of those um, shortly when we do our Q&A. Um, and a number of other frontline organisations, plus um, community networks, um, like some of the ones I've already mentioned, and, and hopefully a growing number of others. Um, so you know, this, this is something that we hope to coordinate, but we don't wish to own it. We want the community to own it, um, and for this to become uh, an understood and entrenched way of doing things in, in communities around Australia. We're really just here as a resource and a, um, a central hub to make this all happen. I'm now going to introduce or ask Stephanie Jones, um, my colleague, to talk a little bit more about the group mentorship program. Um, Stephanie is a refugee lawyer and migration agent who has worked in community refugee sponsorship in Canada for a number of years training and supporting sponsor groups there. And she also grew up in a community in Vancouver that sponsored refugees. She now lives in Sydney and we're very fortunate to have, have found her. Stephanie, I'll, I'll pop up the PowerPoint and hand it over to you to uh, talk about the group mentorship program. Sure, thanks Lisa. So as Lisa mentioned, this is basically a modified form of what we see as ultimately a community refugee sponsorship program. So it's a small pilot and it doesn't cover all of the things that sponsorship would cover. We envision about 10 to 12 mentor groups, at least half of them outside major cities, each matched with a refugee individual or family. And in order to mirror the sponsorship experience, we'll be focusing on recent arrivals. So refugees who've arrived within the last 12 months or so, um, or refugees who are relocating to another community within Australia. Um, there'll be refugees who already hold a refugee type visa and not previously known to the mentor group. Um, the role of the, refugee, of the mentor group is basically to provide six months of practical mentorship support, similar to what you would be doing as a sponsor. Um, and CCN partners will be providing training and support and also working on program development towards a future community refugee sponsorship program. Next slide. So basically, what are we asking from mentors? Um, we're asking for a group of at least five people because I think as our previous speakers have mentioned, settlement is not something that can happen with one person. If you are an individual and don't have a group yet, we'll be sending out an email after this session 
um, giving ways that we can try and link you with other individuals or you can try and find individuals in your local community. Um, the most important criteria for mentors are availability so that you have interest and time to devote to mentoring because it can be quite an intensive process and also diversity of skills, experience and networks. Um, I know a lot of you are involved with refugees and asylum seekers already. Um, and you might not think that you have particularly relevant skills or networks, but the fact that you speak English, the fact that you are able to get on Zoom and be here, um, if you have a landlord who's sympathetic to refugees, if you're working in a workplace that might be open to hiring refugees, even these simple things are all things that could really be helpful in this mentorship program. Um, we'll be sending out an information and application package next week. And this will ask you for detailed information about your group, your group members, skills, experiences, and networks, and also the information uh, and resources available in, uh, in your local area. Um, meanwhile, we're also recruiting refugees for this program, and we'll be asking those refugees to identify one or two settlement goals. So in a situation where they're already living in the community, this could be help with specific aspects of settlements, or if they're thinking of moving to a new community, this could be help with integrating into a new community. And so your application will be really helpful if you can give as much information as possible so that we can match that up with the refugees settlement goals. We'll also be asking you to undergo basic vetting, police checks and working with children checks, um, just for the, the safety and protection of the refugees. Next slide. So what exactly will this mentorship scenario look like? If it's, a, if it's someone already living in your local community, um, they might be somewhat settled, they might have housing, they might have kids in school, but there might be aspects of their settlement journey that they're still working on, such as finding employment or navigating the Australian education system and digital learning in these COVID times. Also, if it's a family, different members of the family may have different um, settlement goals or things that they need help with. So it's important to look at the, the needs of each member of the family as well. Next slide. In a scenario where the refugee might be moving to your community, um, they might have some connection there, such as a job offer. But there might be a lot of other aspects of integrating into your local community, such as housing, local orientation, socialization that they need help with. And they might also be coming with specific needs such as medical needs um, that, you, that you'll need to take into consideration. Next slide. Oh, sorry, there was, I saw there was a question about what is the local area. This will obviously vary depending on um, where you're located, but basically it's an area where you're living, where your group's living and where the refugee is living um, that would make it practicable for you to assist someone in a, a settlement type capacity. So what will we be looking for from our mentors? Basically, we'll be doing some training in September and also providing peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities, both among our mentor groups and with our international networks um, so that you can continue to um, learn and support each other through this journey. Be, pro be providing practical support for the refugee during the mentorship period. And we'll also be asking you to fundraise a small amount of money to help them out with perhaps a, a specific aspect of one of their settlement goals. So in a case where you have a family and you know multiple kids involved in digital learning, maybe they need another device to make that a bit easier. We'll also be asking you to participate in information sharing and monitoring evaluation activities with us or our partners in order to develop the program. Um, and also considering the opportunity to sponsor a refugee family from overseas in 2021, assuming that the necessary policy settings are put in place. Uh, next slide. So basically in terms of where we go from here, um, as I mentioned, we're already in the process of identifying and referring refugees through some of our partner organizations. And we're also in the process of um, putting together mentor groups. Um, information and application package will be going out next week. Applications will be due at the end of August, and then we'll be doing vetting and general training in September. Um, the process of matching up 
uh, the refugees and the venture groups will be a manual process and we'll be working together closely with our partner organizations. As you can imagine, this is a national project and we do want some diversity in terms of where people are located, profiles of refugees, profiles of mentor groups, but we'll do our best to try and match up interested groups uh, with refugees and vice versa. Um, once we've uh, done the matching, we will get agreement from the refugees as well as the mentor groups. We'll finalize the individual support plans, so matching up the refugee settlement goals with your group's uh, resources. And we, we'll also be conducting additional training if there are specific needs. And then the mentorship program will uh, begin in October. Um, so I think we'll end there because I do want to leave time for questions. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and it's so great to have you um, on this journey with us. Um, as you can see, it's not, a, it's not a small thing that we're potentially asking of you. Um, as you would know, uh, for those of you who have met people who've sponsored before, it's, it's quite a commitment. Um, but for many people uh, who, who undertake that, that um, commitment, people will often tell you it's one of the most meaningful things that they'll ever, ever do. And as a, a bit of incentive for some of your, you to become involved as early adopters and, and to help us um, refine this program as, as we work and learn together, um, we have indicated that we've set some of our own funding aside um, to provide it as, as sub-grants to groups that uh, become trained uh, through this group mentorship program. And that funding would uh, contribute to the funding that those groups will need to sponsor someone from overseas in the future. And once again, just like to thank the Sydney Meyer Fund for their generous funding that enables us to uh, be able to provide that seed funding in the, in the future. And there, in the information pack, there'll be some more details about uh, in what situations that seed funding would be available. Um, I think we'll now move on to the Q&A section and we're going to start with a few questions that we received from a number of you before uh, today's session. Uh, thank you to those of you who submitted questions online. Um, Asher is going to facilitate the Q&A and we'll get through as much as we can. Um, and some of the other individuals I'd like you to meet in the context of this Q&A are representatives of the settlement agencies uh, who are involved in this initiative. Um, in particular, Carmen Gali from Settlement Services International, uh, who uh, is involved in settling uh, refugees post-arrival in Sydney and regional New South Wales, among many other things that they do. Uh, Tim Draper from Multicultural Australia, uh, which is responsible for settlement of refugees in Queensland. Um, Maria Sopanis from Ames in Victoria. Um, Ames is involved in resettlement activities in Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania. And Jeremy Leonard from Australian Red Cross, uh, which does settlement in Canberra and surrounds as well as Western Australia. So I'm hoping that we'll have time to hear from each of those individuals uh, in the context of the Q&A as well as um, answering as many of your questions as, as possible. Over to you, Asha. Great, thank you. Um, so, I've got, yeah, I've got a few questions that have been collated, um, sent in previously, as well as we'll try to respond to some of the questions in your chat as well. Uh, if we don't get to them today, we will um, be putting out further information next week. And so you will have a question answered before you um, need to put in an application if you're interested in participating. Uh, the first uh, question actually would go to you, Lisa. Uh, the question is, does the mentor group need to be incorporated or to be linked to an incorporated organisation such as a legal entity? Yeah, that's a great question and it's come up a few times. For the purposes of this initial group mentorship program, we're not imposing a requirement that your group be incorporated or come under the auspices of an existing organisation. That said, it's not a bad idea to think about that as, as um, an optional thing to do. It could well be a requirement under a future government program. So if you're not already 
part of a, um, a separate organization, it might be worth just having a think about organizations in your community that you could attach yourself to, attach your group to, whether that be uh, a church or a migrant service organization or a school or any other organization um, that has a legal personality and who might have a mandate to um, auspice your group for the purposes of participating in refugee sponsorship and mentorship. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, I think we can go to um, Tim Draper from Multicultural Australia. Uh, what sort of support will groups have access to from professional settlement organisations like yourself? Um, if it's within Queensland, we would have a dedicated case manager from our refugee team and the, the details of that person would be uh, made known to all the different groups within Queensland. And we would refer on uh, to general referral agencies that we normally use uh, and, and we know that they're trusted. Uh, things like for family and domestic violence, child protection, um, specific health issues, education issues. If, if there are particular challenges with our family or individuals are particularly vulnerable. We also have uh, internal to our organisation or um, uh, contract about uh, uh, support from what's called uh, SETS, which is a five year from when they first arrive up to five year support. And that would be funded for particularly vulnerable uh, clients. We also have settlement intensive support, SIS, which is for those that are um, ha also have particular needs and challenges that also would be funded. So they would get support from the, the local uh, representatives of those two um, supports in the area. We also have for youth, um, if there are particular education training or working to a, to a job readiness uh, that are particularly vulnerable, and that's with the Migrant Youth Vision Project, which we also uh, are contracted uh, to support uh, here in Queensland. So for all those different things, some will be funded specifically um, by the government um, for those vulnerabilities, and others would just be with direct to certain agencies, which many of you would be aware of anyway, but would be particular to the local area in which the, the, the mentorship group would be uh, based. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the next question on training for Stephanie. Uh, when and where will training take place and is there a cost? So there won't be any cost for the training. Um, when and where training will take place, it will likely be end of August, beginning of September, but the exact mechanics will be determined in conjunction with the groups that are selected for the group mentorship program. It could be in person, it could be online, depending on your availability and of course COVID restrictions. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about um, needs of, of refugees uh, in the program, especially those who've been in the country for only a few months. And there's also a little bit of uh, confusion in, in the chat from some of the questions about whether we're talking about a future program where we sponsor refugees from overseas or this mentorship program, which is our interim COVID plan. Uh, that we're asking you to be part of now. Uh, so just to clarify, uh, the current program, the mentorship program that you're here for today is about supporting refugees who are already in Australia. Um, obviously due to border closures, uh, there's only uh, really a, a minute number of refugees coming into the country at the moment. And so um, we've had to look at how we can support people who might need extra help in Australia already. Uh, a future program would obviously bring in refugees uh, from overseas uh, and you'd be assisting them from um, through the whole resettlement process from there. Uh, so a question for um, Carmen uh, from SSI. Uh, for refugees who have only been in the country for a few months, what do you think their um, needs and priorities will be? Great, thank you. Um, I will apologise in advance because my neighbour has started renovations today. So if there's a really loud drilling noise, I will put myself on mute and, and have someone else answer. Um, but I guess, yeah, looking at refugee needs in the first few months of arrival, it, it very much varies from individual to individual, depending on their background, their, the country that they're coming from, and um, whether or not they're coming with family or not. So obviously this does vary dramatically. But in saying that, there are very much key priorities um, that need to be met within those first few months. And some of them have been touched on already, but things like long-term accommodation, uh, education opportunities, whether it's, you know, school-aged children or higher education or language, 
um, and then obviously employment opportunities as well. And then from that, looking at uh, ongoing health needs. So, I mean, health needs are generally met immediately, but some health needs are ongoing, uh, including mental health needs. Um, and then one of the most important aspects is then the community participation and, and community network. Uh, networking, really being able to uh, be supported by community around them, which I know a few people have mentioned um, on the call today and the importance of building that connection with communities that they're, they're settling in. But I think one of the most important aspects within those first few months of an individual or a family arriving um, is very much about um, building on their current strengths and building on their current capabilities. So really ensuring their own agency to, to navigate all the new systems that um, they're having to get used to in a new country. So whether that mean, you know, sort of our healthcare system, so Medicare, or whether it means our banking system, um, financial systems, starting your own business. So really allowing people to uh, build their own strengths in, in navigating those systems themselves to really um, become independent uh, and, and become as independent as every other citizen in Australia. I think they're the most important uh, factors. Thank you very much. Uh, a question for Lisa, again, I think this is um, most appropriate for you is, um, what, what if there's a disconnect between where the mentor sponsor group is located and where the refugees would like to be located? How are we gonna be doing matching up yeah, it's a good question. And I think pati pat particularly applicable to um, metropolitan environments. Um, uh, some of the refugees that will be part of this program will already be in long term um, housing and will have kids enrolled in schools. So um, given that we're talking about just a six month program, it wouldn't make sense to be asking those people to move um, into your suburb uh, in order to be able to uh, mentor them. Um, so it's really then a question of whether uh, they are proximate enough to you that as, as a mentor group, you feel capable of going to them and supporting them where they are. Um, so, you know, you could apply a rule of thumb of, you know, that you're prepared to um, drive for 20 minutes, for example, to, to, uh, to meet or and support refugees, anyone within a 20 minute radius of you. Um, but it's really going to be up to your group to decide what your capacity is and what your boundaries are. Um, in other cases, um, particularly in regional locations, it may be that we can identify someone who's keen to move into your community, um, assuming that your community has some affordable housing available and possibly uh, the prospect of a job. In that case, um, uh, you know, this, this problem uh, doesn't arrive and arise and you'll have um, people coming into your community and um, it can be quite a satisfying experience helping someone settle from, from the, the get-go. Um, but obviously just underlying all of this is the idea of um, that, that you were trying to help people uh, settle in a sustainable and ongoing way. So we're there to meet their needs, not, not the other way around. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, there's a few people who have asked if we can clarify the eligibility criteria for refugees uh, to be part of this uh, mentorship program. Uh, so can you explain uh, what kind of um, groups of refugees we're looking to support and are there um, limits to young people or ages or uh, certain backgrounds or certain visa types? We're looking to support anyone who has a recognised um, uh, need for protection um, in, in Australia. So uh, that means a, a refugee visa of any sort, um, including temporary protection visas or CHEV visas. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about people who have, uh, you know, the prospect of um, making their lives in Australia in the long term. Uh, we don't anticipate um, applying any age criteria or any country of origin criteria or any other criteria other than that we will be aspiring to get um, a cross section of different types of um, households, I guess. Uh, we'd like to see some individual um, refugees. We'd like to see some family groups. Um, we'd like to see um, some individuals from the LGBTIQ community, uh, perhaps some single parent families so that we can test um, and, and, and tweak and make sure that the, the thing that we're building is going to be suitable for a wide variety of, of refugees. 
Thank you. Uh, a question I'm going to um, ask from uh, Maria from Ames, Australia. Uh, when people are moving to a new area, uh, so it's secondary migration, maybe they've been uh, somewhere else for a year or so, uh, what support do they need when they, uh, when they arrive? Thanks, Asha. Um, as, as you described, secondary migration is generally where people have arrived on a humanitarian visa, been in a metropolitan area generally, and then uh, for whatever reason, it hasn't worked out and they're looking to re-establish themselves in generally regional areas. Um, the way AIMS goes about it is we look at a family model of secondary resettlement so that it is a more sustainable model, long-term sustainable. Um, and the types of support that mentor groups um, could become involved in and what families require is very much that welcoming community on arrival. So, um, you know, building the knowledge of the community, whether it's a small or, or a larger community, um, introductions to employment opportunities, health um, um, services, community services, such as neighbourhood house, houses are often very critical to allow um, family members to continue English language development, uh, connection with local schools, very important for different members of the family. Um, also, um, secondary employment opportunities for other members of the family. You know, it'd be really great um, for some of the teenage children to be able to get opportunity to casual employment like their, their peers um, do as well, so that they're on a, a pathway to, 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 you know, good employment outcomes going forward. Um, really being there to support the family in a range of different aspects. So health, education, employment, um, community services. But as Carmen said, it is about, you know, building their independence as well. So we really want to build their skill and ability to become integral members of that community. I'll leave it there, Asha. Thank you, uh, Maria. Uh, a question for Jeremy. Uh, I have a spare bedroom and I'd like to, uh, I'd love to house and feed one or two refugees free of charge. I'd also like to teach, teach them English. Is this possible? Yeah, thanks. Um, so look, housing is, well, stable. Yeah, housing where it's stable and appropriate is really key to uh, effective settlement. Um, I guess where people have a room or wishing to provide accommodation, I would say it depends on whether you're intending to do so on a temporary or ongoing basis. So I guess in the context of settlement, we would encourage those um, and welcome those who could open their homes where they were able to do so in a way that was durable and stable. So this could be welcoming a single or a couple um, as housemates, or if you own a rental property um, to you know, contact the settlement agencies or um, other sector services um, to support a family into a tenancy. Short-term accommodation. So, if it's if you're if the intent was to do so on a like a temporary basis, um, is a critical need across all of Australia. Um, so, if you are able to only open your home up for a short period of time, um, I'd suggest probably connecting in with like asylum seek resource centres or migrant resource centres. Um, who and those other agencies that provide emergency assistance, particularly if people become um, homeless or um, are, are in need. Um, but I would see this as separate to the kind of outcomes that we would want to be seeing um, in the context of uh, settlement and welcoming people to new communities. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. And I think it's going to be time, uh, that's going to be the end of our time for questions. Uh, we do have all your questions down in the chat. So if you have any more, put them down now and we will save that chat and make sure uh, all those questions are answered um, before you apply for the program. And I'll hand over now back to Lisa. You're on mute. Thanks. Thanks everyone. And I'm, I'm sorry that we're going to have to um, cut it short, but I'm a big believer in finishing on time. 
just to reiterate next steps, um, tomorrow we'll share a recording of this meeting with all of you and you're free, free to circulate that with anyone you think uh, might be interested in. In that email, there will also be a form that you can fill in if you want us to help you connect with other individuals um, who live near you. We, we can't promise that we'll be able to meet everyone's needs, but we will do our best to put you in touch with one another and then hand it over to you to see whether you can work together with those people. Um, in around a week or so, we will send out an information pack with an application form for groups that are interested um, in participating in this group mentorship program. And nothing is signed in blood. So, you know, if you think it's of interest, I would encourage you to engage and um, go on the journey. And if at any point you decide that it's not for you, then you're, you're free to, to pull out. But um, uh, it would be great to see a number of you putting in applications to, to be part of the program. Um, Stephanie will be the primary point of contact um, with you all if, if you're interested in pursuing this. Um, I would suggest that you give her a, a few days um, breathing space while she gets that information pack ready to go out to you. But after that, um, I would imagine she'll be tic-tacking back and forth with, um, some of, uh, with all of your groups um, to answer any individual questions that you might have. And, and we will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible from, from today um, in that information pack. Um, so I'll just wrap up by saying we're so delighted to see such a strong level of interest from um, people all around the country. Uh, we will do our very best to involve everyone who wants to be part of this in a way that suits them. Um, our, our aspirations are to get 12 groups up and running. If we find that we can't accommodate your group or you, you're, this doesn't suit your group, that doesn't mean that there won't be anything else that you can do um, in, this, in this context. Um, we'll be looking for opportunities later in the year to perhaps um, train other groups um, for the purposes of, of future programs in, in future years. There may well be ad advocacy opportunities as well as opportunities for you to uh, engage with others in your community um, around sort of building an awareness of this, this approach. And finally, I just want to re remind you all of um, the, the purpose of, of all this work, apart from expanding resettlement, um, you as, as potential participants in a sponsorship or mentorship program are incredibly powerful in uh, the way that you can influence hearts and minds in your organiser, in, in your communities. Um, last year, there was a poll conducted in Canada that uh, found that roughly 2 million Canadians um, have been involved directly in sponsorship programs and around 7 million Canadians uh, know someone who's been involved. And that means about a third of the adult Canadian population um, has either been directly involved or knows someone who has. And the power of that in terms of embedding an understanding of refugee journeys, refugee experiences and a compassion for refugees um, is, is, cannot be underestimated. So, um, you know, I'd just like to encourage you all to think about this um, in that big picture scenario and um, help us go on this, well, join us in going on this journey and uh, uh, changing the way uh, Australian communities approach uh, refugees and uh, being part of that ripple effect. Um, I hope you'll all agree with me that that vision is um, desirable, um, powerful and also possible. So on that note, I'll say thank you very much and we look forward to being in touch with all of you in the, the weeks and months ahead. Have a great week, everyone, and stay safe.